Welcome to San Diego, a trauma-informed city. City Council declared the city trauma-informed uh, earlier in the summer, and mainly because of the powerful and important lessons that I have learned from all of you. And there are many familiar faces here, many from uh, my district that I represent, District 9. Hey, hey. We got our Mid-City Can, we have our Somali Bantu and other uh, entities here, organizations, and, the, and what else? Star Pal. Star Pal. Hello. How are you, Portia? Uh, the mayor's representative is here, Darnisha Hunter, thank you. And I see National Conflict Resolution Center uh, and educators and so many students who, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, teach us every single day how to be better people. But we have discovered uh, through, uh, well, Dana Brown has been my mentor on this issue, I just want to say that, um, talking to me over the course of a few years about case studies and, um, and trauma in the community, and as a representative for 150,000 people in the Mid-City community, I've been, I've been seeing this, all of this, through a different set of eyes, and have grown into this understanding that we need to be compassionate to one another. We need to be aware of other person's pain. And we need to be there as part of the solution to help them pull their lives together to be healthy and happy and productive. But little kids are coming to our schools. Cherokee Point Elementary, where are you? There you go. Thank you. I, we always call him doctor. <laughs> but thank you, Godwin. Uh, it's great to see you. And thank you for your leadership. But, uh, Cherokee Point became sort of ground zero for this concept of trauma-informed education, where a city, the school staff and teachers are, are taught to recognize symptoms basically of PTSD. Am I right? And, uh, and to understand that sometimes kids don't pay attention in class, or they act out, or they've got their heads down on the desk, and it's not because they just don't want to be there and they want to create, you know, some kind of a diversion, but it's because they're not living well at home. They are uh, facing uh, abuse or neglect. They're seeing police actions, crime. Um, they're not being fed well. Whatever it might be, these little, these little kids are trying to survive as best they can. And sometimes it's rolling up in a ball or it's acting out in a class. And, and the more we're trained to recognize that these are symptoms of some kind of trauma, the quicker we can get to it and address these issues for these boys and girls uh, who are our future. And now on the national stage, you know, we talk about the prison overcrowding situation and the justice system and how it's out of whack. Well, this is one of the solutions, I believe. If we, if we help uh, support children early on, uh, we'll have a better chance of seeing children who are successful in life not aligning themselves with gangs or getting into other trouble and winding up in the justice system. Because the justice system, quite frankly, hasn't caught up with the people who are so passionate about our trauma-informed movement, but they will. You know, in speaking with the psychiatrist at the Aspire program, the military program, VA's program for uh, Marines and soldiers coming back uh, from war with PTSD, uh, acknowledged that Many of these folks maybe had it before they went into the military, coming from inner city neighborhoods or environments where they are dealing with abuse uh, day in and day out, or being assaulted with images day in and day out that traumatize them. And so I think you're onto something. We're all onto something. Our police department has now uh, uh, invited trainers to come in and teach them about trauma-informed practices, especially our juvenile unit, our uh, park and rec staff, our library staff, employees at the city who come in contact with kids and families. I think that we're all coming to accept that we, we really are a village. And it takes each and every one of us getting up in the morning, deciding that we're going to be compassionate and we're going to share something with somebody else who is struggling and we are going to make a difference. And one by one, we can do that. This film will show graphic examples, but if we stand up and look around us here in San Diego, we see these examples each and every day. And then the question is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? And when do we start? 
I say we all step in uh, with both feet, and we do it now. Time is fleeting, and the sooner we can begin the healing, uh, the sooner we will uh, create, and ultimately young people will inherit a healthier society, a healthier planet, and will learn to love themselves. So thanks for being here and taking the time to learn more about this very, very important issue. And I hope that during the panel discussion, you'll, you'll look inward. How will I be an agent of change? How will I be the person who wraps loving arms around somebody, some young person who's been traumatized? And how will we walk together into our healthier future? Thank you all for being here, all our friends and friends-to-be. Uh, thanks for being part of the solution. In every school in America, walking down every street in America, there are the kids that get labeled, get rid of them. They're nothing but trouble. Lincoln sits right in the heart of the most assaults, gang activity, truancy. I did hear that it was the worst school you could ever go to. Kids had knives, the fights, absolute chaos. He pissed me off and I threw a chair at him. And I told him I was gonna kill him. All of them were meth out. I was invited to go to a conference about complex trauma and what stress does to the brain. Behavior is a symptom of what's going on in their life. My mom was like, you're Shanley. She's the only thing I had. And for her to abandon me like that. His coping mechanism was drinking a ton, smoking a ton. I remember one night, I just, I didn't want to be alive. It hit me, and it hit me really hard. You have to unconditionally love them, and you have to believe that their behavior might be out of their control. I love playing guitar with several of these guys. I feel like that's almost as strong as anything we ever do in class. After that, he wasn't only a disciplined figure, he was like a friend. Half of the student body had over a 3.2 GPA. To watch their confidence come back has been incredible. I'm not by myself anymore, I got a team. If I can do it, all of you can definitely do it. It's not that I'm judging you. I know why you're smoking weed. I know why you smoke meth. I know why you're in fights. You don't want to feel. I mean, that's the big challenge is I'm asking you to try feeling for a little bit because sometimes when you feel, it guides you in the direction that you should be going and not to where you are. I'm so pleased to see so much more of this topic in the media, and for me it's really important to talk about in the media because it's at the root of so many of the other headlines that we see. And I write those headlines too, suspension rates, crime, that sort of thing, um, but I also get to write really positive headlines about things people in City Heights are doing, and so this panel is going to help us hear a little bit more about that work. So I wanted to invite to the stage Chief of Probation Mac Jenkins. Is he here? So M Mac Jenkins is the Chief of Probation here in San Diego County, and he's really been a key figure in the work that the county has been doing to look at alternative sentencing and alternatives to arrest for the prison-involved population. The county, like all California counties, have been implementing the AB 109, so prison realignment, as well as Prop 47. And so there are a lot more people um, in the county's hands getting services, and we'll hear more about that. I also wanted to invite to the stage Cindy Martin. Cindy Martin actually um, went to school in City Heights and then um, was the principal at Central Elementary School before becoming um, the superintendent of the San Diego Unified School District. And she's working to make sure that every neighborhood has a quality school and that um, there's equity in services and in instruction. And I wanted to invite um, Jose Granados. Jose is a parent of four children in City Heights, and two of them go to Cherokee Point Elementary School, where he is um, 
involved, like a lot of parents at Cherokee Point Elementary School. Um, there has been a multi-year initiative there to get parents engaged, um, to lower suspension rates, and to attack some of those issues that sort of happen at home to um, kind of lead to suspensions. And so he'll tell us more about that. And then I also wanted to invite up May Lazo, Larissa Figueroa, and Edith Okello. These young women go to Crawford High School and they're part of the Law Academy there. And a lot of the strategies that we saw in the film, they're actually implementing at Crawford High School. And so they'll tell us more about that. But they've been interning with the National Conflict Resolution Center and actually um, working to take some of what they've been doing and spread it to other schools in San Diego Unified. So I wanted to start just by kind of um, asking all of you to elaborate a little bit more on what it, the kind of work that you're doing to address trauma. So we'll start with you, Mac. Okay, first, uh, thank you, very happy to be here. And that was quite a powerful movie. Um, I thought the movie did a really nice job of um, letting us see uh, from a very different lens the experience of, uh, of youth and what they go through with trauma. But M Marty said something, Marty Emerald, when she was here earlier, and when she was talking about the whole focus on being a trauma-informed community and having a focus on trauma, and what she said was the justice system is behind. Um, and I think that's a true statement. The justice system is behind, but the justice system is moving. Um, what I like to share when I um, talk about what my department is doing is that this is my 38th year in the criminal justice system and, and working in the juvenile justice system. And it wasn't until about three years ago, maybe four, um, that I first heard about, heard the word trauma and trauma-informed care in the context of juvenile delinquency. You know, that might be my own failing, but I thought it was significant because my department has um, invested in a program called Positive Youth, Positive Youth Justice Initiative, which is based on what's called a positive youth development model. As a part of our participating in that program, uh, we've um, learned about how a lot of the youth who come into the juvenile justice system, one, have had a beginning in the child welfare system. And so you know that youth that have had a beginning in the child welfare system, there's a couple of truths about that. If a, if a child has been in the child welfare system, they have been abused, abandoned, or neglected. And so many of those youth um, end up, rightly or wrongly, crossing over into the, to the juvenile justice system. We call them crossover youth. And so part of um, a focus that we have in my department in, in terms of trying to better serve those youth and their families, trying to improve their outcomes, we participated in this positive youth development training and have learned um, and are learning about the impact of trauma on kids that are coming into the juvenile justice system. And so we've had a focus in my department of training every single probation department employee on trauma-informed care. And so one of the things that I've done is I actually hired a uh, clinical psychologist who, and we created a division called our Probation Department Treatment Services and Clinical Services Division. And so he's headed up an effort working with community partners. Rosanna Lozada is out in the audience, and she's helped us do this. Uh, we've been taking all of the probation department employees through trauma-informed care so that we, as a department, and given our role in the dual justice system, can um, learn a little bit more about what the film said. Um, and what we try to talk about is not, what I really want to see every probation employee do is not look at kids that come to the system by the charge that brought them there, but really look more deeply into what's led to that behavior so that we can be in a better position of trying to better serve them. So right now, I've got 1,300 employees, and I think about all but a 1,000 of them have been through trauma training. So we're hopefully this year going to be finishing that trauma training and then even trying to take it to the next step. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, Cindy, where is the school district at with implementing some of these strategies? Well, first of all, I, I need to recognize San Diego Unified staff members that are here. So teachers, first, can you please stand up, San Diego Unified teachers? And principals, San Diego Unified principals and district office staff, please stand up. So that's how I'm going to start by answering a question, where are we? We're in the house. And we're here, and we're engaged, and teachers on the front line every single day alongside the students. 
um, learning and acting and making decisions on behalf of students and then the training um, a couple uh, over a year ago we had a very significant moment where Dr. Joe Fulcher, who was our chief student services officer, did a board presentation around restorative practices and declaring our district as a restorative district and what that means to be a restorative district and put practices in place and taking the programs that we see at Crawford and at Hoover and at Cherokee Point where we have ground zero for the practices that work. How do we take those to scale? How do we replicate what's working? Take it to scale, do it in a way that's sustainable and um, systemic so that we can deliver on what we know works for our students. And so one of the first things that we did um, as we launched that work is changed our discipline practices. And in San Diego Unified, we used to have 15 reasons why students were mandatorily expelled from the district and mandatory expulsion based on 15 reasons when we looked at that and said 10 of those reasons were made up by our own district. Five of them are required by California ed, ed code, but 10 were part of our own policy. So if we made those up, we can change those. So we removed the mandatory expulsion and um, you can't just remove mandatory expulsion and then like act like everything's fine. There has to be supports in place and positive behavior intervention support services, the PBIS program in our elementary schools, middle schools, the programs that work, that intervene, have to be expanded, have to be invested in, and have to be taken to scale. And so we didn't just, you, you change policy and you begin to change practices, you change belief systems and you put supports in place. And we have seen uh, ex our expulsion rate reduced by 50%, and that expulsion rate isn't just you removed all these reasons to expel, you put supports in place, and what, an example, people say, well, what were the things that you removed? One of the, one of the um, mandatory reasons for expulsion was um, assault on a staff member, and there's a story about a student who had, um, a high school student whose family was experiencing homelessness, the father had been deported, and the mother had been living in a home with three, four kids, and after six months, finally was not able to live in her house anymore. So that morning, got up and told the little kid, told the older son, okay, everybody pack everything up because we're not gonna be able to come back to this apartment tonight. And she had to go off early, catch a bus to work, and she had to tell the fan, her older son and the three younger kids, meet me at the flagpole, meet me here, we'll figure out where to stay that night. And kids went off to school, and by the time the older son dropped off the elementary school kid, the middle school student, and got himself to high school, went to his first period class, and he fell asleep in class. He was tired, and everything he owned was in his backpack. He fell asleep in class. A teacher touched him to, to say, hey, what's going on? And he popped up, and he, coming out of, out of a dead sleep with somebody pulling his backpack that had all his possessions in it, he hit the teacher. He, he didn't mean to hit the teacher. It wasn't an, a, 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 he didn't mean to assault the teacher, knew that. But if, that's, if, you mad, if it's a mandatory expulsion, where are you gonna expel that student to? He's homeless. So for the principal to have the discretion in that particular situation, the teacher was fine and the, you know it, it all worked out, but that's an example of let's use some, some critical thinking in every situation and give our teachers support they need to be able to support kids in the classroom, principals the discretion they need to engage in whatever students bring into it. And that's just one small story of the different reasons why we need to have the ability and the discretion to make, make decisions on behalf of kids. And I know at, at campuses like Cherokee Point, in addition to changing um, what, how we look at expulsions, they've also moved completely to in-school suspension. Um, Cherokee Point has really been kind of the sandbox for a lot of these efforts. Jose, can you talk about the work that you guys have been doing to expand on what the district is doing and, and in some ways inspire the district? Um, well, I just want to say thank you to invite me. Uh, it's, a real, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, uh, what Cherokee Point is doing uh, a really amazing pro uh, program or, or that it's, it's free on suspensions that uh, uh, when the kids get uh, uh, their bad behaviors or, or, or hitting or anything, kids in the past will get suspended. Here now, here w they, look, they look at the kids and, and try to figure out why, why, what's going on. And uh, talking to uh, personnel, it, it happens. And, and having a back uh, 
help from them. It, it, it's, it's amazing because uh, uh, instead of suspend my kids, they were there for me, you know? And it's now the kid wants to go to school. Now the kids want to learn. Uh, they feel s safe, you know? So, so I think it's working. It's, it is working, so. And you guys have gone beyond the, dis the school discipline and tried to get at some of the root causes by working with parents, is that right? Yeah, um, yeah. There's there's a lot of uh, workshops there. There's a lot of uh, um, uh, resources there. The 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 parents feel come and learn and and teach their kids. You know. Thank you. And then at Crawford, there are sort of three different interventions that students there have taken on. So let's start with Larissa. Do you want to explain one of them? So one of the practices we have is Teen Court, which is a diversion, legal diversion program for kids, students who have committed a first um, misdemeanor. And well, instead of going through juvenile court, they are referred um, to Teen Court, where they go and their um, peers, it's, um, we're training um, the principles of restorative justice, which are repairing the harm, offender accountability, and community safety. And um, there is an adult judge who makes sure that the process is followed, but it is the peers who ask the questions and we hear out their story, we hear what they have to say, how the event came about, and how they do in school, how they do at home, you know, what other responsibilities do they have at home. So we really get to know the background story of the youth and how maybe it was just they weren't thinking straight or it was just peer pressure. And afterwards, we come up with a restorative sentence, which could be a community service hours, tutoring, um, a reflection essay, or a peer pressure workshop, or if there's been um, alcohol or drug abuse, we could refer them to a workshop as well. So it's really just to help out the kid, and they have 90 days to complete it, and once they do, it is completely erased. The whole thing is completely erased from their record, and they get to start again and have a second chance, because if you have something in your record, it's hard to get a job or go off to college, and we just clear it all out, and they have a brand new start. Thanks. I, I was just looking at the Crawford staff, so proud over there, and the NCRC, Justine, just watching the students speak about restorative practice and what that really means, and she's not talking about you, you do something wrong, and then what's the punishment? It's you did something wrong, what harm was caused, and how do we repair that harm, and the learning that happens. So there's actually teaching that's going on instead of just doling out discipline and then nothing actually changes. And so the pride that I see in the staff and you being able to describe it, that's, that's what's happening. May, do you wanna pick that up? Um, what's the other strategy that you have at Crawford? The next one would be restorative circles. So we barely incorporated this at Crawford last year, but the whole point is to build community, although there are, are a lot of different circles, but the main goal here is to build community because sometimes, well, what I've experienced is that sometimes we go into the classes and the students don't really, well, some students don't really open up and, um, from my point of view, it's probably because they're not used to someone coming into the class and actually asking them, oh, how are you today? Or um, what's the good thing that happened to you? And it's to build community and also trust um, because one of the guidelines is to honor privacy. So whatever is said there stays between us. So yeah. And Edith, do you want to talk about the third strategy that Crawford has? Yeah, um, and the third strategy that we have at Crawford is um, peer mediation. And it's basically a process of um, when two disputants are having like problems with each other and um, we, they refer the teacher or the, um, the students, they come to the Law Academy and we sit them both down and like um, let them talk it out, let them figure out a way of um, solving their problems, you know? 
And we kind of just sit there and kind of like keep it in control so there's like no fighting or anything. Um, and one of the things I, I really appreciate about uh, peer mediation is the fact that you're, you're getting to understand um, each other, you're getting to understand each other's point of view. And it's not like, oh, um, she's talking crap about me, so I'm gonna go tell the principal, you know? It's like, I'm gonna sit down like, why are you talking crap about me, you know? And so <laughs> that's what I really appreciate about it. I'm curious if any of you have kind of, if there's one um, peer mediation or a community circle that really stood out to you is, is really, you know, this is why we're doing this kind of work at Crawford. Do any of you have an experience like that with your peers? Most of my experiences came from the restorative circles because there was really no way to prepare for a circle. Like, you have to prepare for the unexpected because you don't know what's going to happen in a circle. We try to make them like simple questions so that they could just know more about each other, but some of them really got deep. For example, one of the questions could be a person in your family who you admire or are very thankful for, and they say it, and then it comes to a person where it's like, well, they passed away, so they feel like they have no one. So it's just like you really have to just, one of the things about the circle is that eventually we're all there for each other, you know, it's like we hold each other in that circle, so we get to, be there for that person, and we always include the teacher in the circles. You know, we we invite them to the circle so they get to know their students as well a lot better, and, and not just the students to students, but the teacher to teacher as well. And they get to see that their students are going through these things, and they become more understanding of that. And Mayor, before the the viewing, we were before the screening, um, we were talking a little bit, and you had mentioned that you actually transferred to Crawford because you were bullied at your previous school. Can you talk about the differences between the two schools? So I went to a school that was zero tolerance, and I was being bullied. But those people that were bullying me had been close friends before. So I felt like if I went to tell the principal that they would immediately get expelled because there were um, like worse stuff that was happening and I didn't feel comfortable. But then when I transitioned, then I left that school and I transitioned into Crawford and I started um, learning about restorative practices and seeing how, how they didn't just like kick you out. They would talk to you and you would understand the other person's point of view. And that would have been nice to know why. Well, I kind of knew the reason <clears throat> but I also wanted to know how they felt like like why they were targeting me like as bad as they were and that's that's what's um happening at Crawford like it's not like oh, okay you did something just leave or, or people will be scared because they're scared that this person is going to get punished or that they can get punished too because of what happened it seems like with trauma-informed care and restorative justice, it really takes the judgment away from both sides. And kind of on that note, um, I think that all of us kind of get the blinders on and you don't really know what you don't know. And so Mac, I wanted to ask you, as your probation officers are going through trauma-informed care, what's surprising them about this? I won't say it's surprising because um a lot of people that are drawn to probation work, uh, specifically working with juveniles, when I talk with new staff and I talk with new officers, I, a lot of times I'll ask them, what is it that you want to do? And what they'll say is, I want to help kids. Or I want to, um, I want to try and help uh, make a positive impact with some youth and help them turn, turn their lives around. So it, it doesn't surprise me at all that as we try to move to a more trauma-informed, be a more trauma-informed department and try and and teach new staff those skills that they embrace that. Um, what's a challenge is the older staff who, who've come up in a system where the, that wasn't the focus, where they might have um, uh, tried to apply a probation approach in a more, I, I use the term, trail them, nail them, jail them mode. But see, that's an old mode that doesn't work. So what, what we're focused on now is, is again, in addition to being trauma-informed, but having a focus really on behavior change. So, and that's embraced. That, that's not a difficult sell for officers. So for some of the older officers trying to navigate between the balance of accountability and at the same time uh, offer a restorative approach um, is still where we have to get to. If you notice in the film that I thought it was really 
um, really impactful when they showed the exchange between, was it Stephen who had gone AWOL for a while, or was that his name, the one guy who'd gone AWOL? And the text exchange between he and the teacher at the time, where he was just berating the teacher, just being completely disrespectful, or it would be seen as being disrespectful, but you saw the teacher's response. The teacher's response was unconditional. The teacher's response was empathetic. The teacher's response was supportive. Now, imagine that being a probation officer, where he's working with somebody on their caseload, and that, that child is talking to him that way. Old school probation officers aren't too cool with that. <laughs> so they, they will have to and, and are now having to kind of appreciate what I said before, that kids that we work with in the system aren't defined by the charge that brought them there. It's a matter of really trying to have a sense and an ability to know, you know what is behind the youth, when, what, what is driving the behavior, what is even driving um, the way that they might be engaging uh, with us at the time. So that really is the challenge. Um, and again, as we move forward, um, I am pleasantly, and I won't, again, won't say surprised, but pleased at how officers are, are learning that. But, it's, but it is, it is um, I won't say it's a slow journey, but it is a, it one's, it's one that needs to be led and one that needs to be pushed. I have a similar question for you. Is it difficult to get teachers on board with restorative justice? I, their job is so stressful. How do you get them on board? And then the second part of that question is, how do you take what we're seeing in City Heights and move it to more campuses? Well, I looked at right out at our teachers and our teachers union president, Li President Lindsay Burningham's here. I see Jen Carpenter and Ceci and Bradley and other teachers. And is it hard to get them on board? Teachers come to this work with their full hearts. And what they need is the support to be able to do what's in their heart. When you have students that are very challenging, you want to make sure there's a network of support and it's not just the teacher in the classroom facing a challenge on their own, but that there's a support system in the entire school and the community. And when I see the community partners that are in this room and what it takes to be able to wrap support around that teacher who's in that classroom in that moment, who's ready to offer unconditional love and respond in the way that you saw in that text message and have our school police department work with city police, our probation officers understanding what's happening in the classroom, teachers know that they're not facing the challenges alone, and they can, you know, you, teachers go into teaching to change lives, and it's one of the most rewarding professions that arguably that there is in our country, and it's most important work, and we know that the children will bring tremendous challenges, and are we doing enough to support our teachers? that they can come with their full heart and act from their full heart and have the support that they need to do this work. And there's training, there's staff development that's needed, there's time that teachers need to do their own work, to have their own restorative circles, to work with one another. Um, Ceci was just speaking in a meeting on Sunday morning and just she moved me, Ceci's a third grade teacher? So, second grade teacher, um, and she talked to, for me as a superintendent to hear a teacher on a Sunday morning community meeting talk about the support she's been given to do this work, that brought tears to my eyes because I know the work that we're doing as a district has reached her as a teacher, getting the support that she needs to do what she knows works for kids, and I forgot the second part of your question. What, what needs to be done to move some of these strategies to more campuses? So, funding. I mean, I, we will never use the idea of there's not enough money to do it, but what we have are very promising practices that work. And when we can, first of all, I don't know if Steve's still in the room, the California Endowment, but the work of partnering with the California Endowment, looking at the programs that work through um, the partnerships that we currently have, I mean, I'm overwhelmed by the partnerships that we have in the community. And so you take the nonprofit work and then the district work and you begin to leverage resources and you want a coherent, systemic, strategic strategy, strategic approach to how, this, to how this works, but you're taking those best practices. When you hear Joe Austin tell the story of what he did at Hoover last year and all the results he sees there, how do we take that, replicate it, take it to scale? Well, you start the work, the one restorative circle that I got to go to that Justine from NCRC was doing at Crawford, I happened to walk in on it, sit at that circle and say, we need that in every one of our classrooms. We see significant investment and we're thankful for the investment in the endowment California, from the California endowment and then leverage the community partners that want to be a part of this. You visit a lot of schools for your work as superintendent. Do the schools that have these sorts of programs feel different when you're walking through the halls? The minute you walk on campus, you can tell. 
you can tell the, the, the feel, the energy of the school, the way you're even greeted in the front office when you're walking into classrooms, when you're walking in hallways, when kids come up to me and look me in the eye and say hello versus not making eye contact and just sort of sitting quietly and you know following rules of the classroom. You can just tell the warmth of the school, the energy of the school, the connectedness, and kids that want to reach out and talk to you. I wanted to kind of challenge all of you to challenge the audience. What can people do after they've watched the screening when they go home? What can they do? So whoever has an answer. If you learn something, share it. And um, if you um, know other colleagues that you're working with that may have a, be in a position to uh, impact youth uh, but don't know about the impact of trauma in a youth, youth's life, um, tell them about it. Tell them to set up their own uh, course to go into um, trauma-informed training, trauma-informed care, and tell them to go with open minds. Tell them to be prepared to challenge old belief systems and to replace them with new knowledge. Um, and then support your local probation officers. I'm going to also amend the question, amend the question a little bit for our ladies who are here sitting next to some of the policymakers. If you have some um, a, cha a challenge for them, that's good too. Um, I would say it would be like if we could get a hold of this uh, screening, it would be really great if you like bring a few of your friends and kind of like sit down and just watch the screening and have a small discussion mm -hmm. after it and kind of get everybody's input on it. I think that would be great. Um, I think something you could definitely take away from the film, you know, is to see beyond the child, to see beyond the student. They're, don't look at their grades, don't look at their past, you know, everybody's been through something, you know, look past that, look at who, what kind of person they really are, you know, get to know them, you know, just, you'll learn so much from them, you know. What I will tell you guys to do as a parent, uh, and what I see in the film, the kids don't care for you guys, uh, work love you, all right? So I challenge you to tell your kids how much you love them. That's, that's, that's. There's, there's always a call to action, and, and those that will come to a movie theater on a, what is it, a Monday night and watch a movie and stay late for a panel like this, this is going to be preaching to the choir, but who, who are the 10 people or 15 people that you can tell this story to that haven't yet heard this story, that don't yet understand what it takes to fundamentally transform public education and that we are moving past the last 10 years of a dark cloud over public education where the public was led to believe that the product of our, of our public school system was a test score and that we're past that and that there's a new story to tell about public education and that we're here to create conditions where each and every student is given the supports and the resources that they need, social, emotional, and academic, so that they can become a contributing, participating member of society and a positive impact in their community. And we've unlocked the genius in each and every student so they're a contributing member. Are you helping to tell that story? Ask more of us engage us as educators in that conversation. I can challenge you as a member of the media and thank you for being here and for, for willing, being willing to host this and to be willing to write other headlines and tell the full story of public education instead of a part of the story. And you're all here. Are you helping people to understand the impact that a high quality public education system can have on our city and our state and our nation? Tell that story and help us tell it and help us bring more resources to the work that we're doing every day.